Hi, this is Douglas Koshlin from the University of California at Berkeley. And I, today I want to tell you about the mysterious biological function of chromosome loops. Today's lecture will not be something you can found in a textbook because this area of chromosome uh, biology is very active and changing. And I wanted to give you a little sense of uh, a problem in biology which is uh, unresolved but exciting. So we start with the fact that segregating chromosomes acquire two essential structural features needed for their segregation. An interphase, the chromatin, is diffuse. During S phase, the the, each uh, DNA molecule of each chromosome is replicated, generate two copies, which are called sister chromatids. And these uh, replicated copies are tethered together to generate sister chromatid cohesion. Once uh, cells enter uh, mitosis, uh, the segregating or the sister chromatids uh, undergo a process of condensation that leads to a highly compacted uh, form of, two of the sister chromatids, which are visualized in many micrographs of mitotic chromosomes. So uh, in the 1990s, one of the really sort of big questions in the field was, what are the factors that promote higher order chromosome structure that are needed for chromosome segregation uh, in a eukaryotic cell? And uh, my laboratories and others uh, discovered that these processes of chromosome uh, organization uh, were carried out by a magical family of SMC family of protein complexes. So SMC stands for structural maintenance of chromosomes. And it turned out that uh, pretty remarkably, they weren't just found in eukaryotes, but they were also found in prokaryotes. So these are uh, in all forms of life that need to organize their chromosomes. Furthermore, uh, what made them particularly intriguing was that they had an unusual structure. They were long, 50 nanometers in, in length due to long coil coils, and they were flexible, which allowed them to achieve multiple conformations, uh, which we will see uh, is important. But at this time, it was very intriguing as to why were they so big and why were they so long and, and so flexible. So one of the first systemic complexes that was discovered was cohesin, and its role was to tether together sister chromatids to generate sister chromatid cohesion that I just told you about. Uh, cohesin is bound to the newly replicated uh, sister chromatids as they're being formed during S phase, such that by the end of DNA replication, the two replicated molecules are cohesed along their length. So what is the importance of sister chromatid cohesion? Well, it, attached, it, it promotes proper bipolar attaching uh, by both uh, promoting uh, sterically constraining the two replicated chromosomes uh, to attach to microtubules from opposite poles of the mitotic spindle. And once attached, it stabilizes these sort of bipolar attachments because the, the consequence of those bipolar attachments generates tension as the microtubules try to pull apart the sister chromatids, um, but they can't because they're tethered together by cohesin. And clearly the importance of achieving this bipolar attachment is in fact uh, to make sure that the newly replicated molecules segregate to opposite poles during mitosis, such that upon cytokinesis, each daughter cell receives uh, one and only one copy of each of the two, uh, of each of the initial chromosomes in the, in, in the initial cell. And that's clearly important for the proper uh, uh, function of the cell and subsequent cell divisions. So uh, condensin is another SMC complex and its job is to tether DNA, DNA in regions within, within a sister chromatid to generate loops that compact the DNA. And these loops can be seen in uh, micrographs of meiotic chromosomes. Here shown are the lamp brush chromosomes of, um, and of, of the salamander. But you can also see these loops if you um, partially denature the mitotic chromosomes. So why do you condense the chromosomes? Well, one is to allow the cell to move them around uh, in mitosis without entangling with each other. And the second is 
that the chromosomes have to achieve a short enough length such that when they undergo, um, get moved to the poles, they are not, uh, the, the piece of DNA does, does not extend over the plane of cytokinesis, which would then uh, cleave the DNA. And this is indeed observed if the DNA only partially uh, condenses. So um, this was all sort of a, our understanding of chromosome structure as the result of being able to visualize them uh, in the microscope. However, a new method came to visualize chromosome structure. Um, and that method was a, a very nice method developed originally in Joe Decker's lab. And it's called 3C chromosome confirmation capture. So uh, in this really ingenious method, what happens is that uh, you take a cell, and uh, in that cell, the nucleosomes may be organized such that two particular nucleosomes are in close proximity to each other. You can capture that by a, adding a cross-linking reagent. And now you digest, uh, you break the cells open, and you digest the chromatin with a restriction enzyme. The, uh, this is a result of this, the two nucleosomes and their associated DNA that have been cross-linked, the DNA ends uh, will be in close proximity and can be ligated together to generate a chimeric piece of DNA uh, with the DNA uh, 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 stuck, stitched together from uh, the two nucleosomes. You then generate paired end reads by DNA sequencing, and the result of that is you get the chromosome coordinates of the contacting nucleosomes. So how do you interpret, um, uh, how do you organize this information to make it in, uh, interpreted in interesting ways. Well, uh, what you do is, uh, let's imagine a situation where you have unstructured chromatin. You most likely will cross-link two neighboring nucleosomes. And um, those two nucleosomes, let's just say, for example, uh, come from chromosome one at position 1,000 and 1,200. So those are the two coordinates. And you plot them on a, uh, uh, on a graph. Um, and you will generate a contact map. And so for those particular two nucleosomes, because their two coordinates are very close to each other, they will lie close to the diagonal. In contrast, if the chromatin forms a loop, then the two nucleosomes that are cross-linked from each, to each other may be very far apart from each other. Let's say at position 1,000 on chromosome 1 and 5,000 on chromosome 1. So those two coordinates, 1,000 and 5,000, will plot off the diagonal as a spot. And because these graphs are actually sort of a, a mirror, there's mirror symmetry, the same uh, coordinates will appear as a, a second spot off the diagonal in a mirror symmetric position. Okay, so once you have this technology, you apply it. In this case, it was applied to metasome chromosomes. And in the first surprise came that in interphase, they observed loops 550 to 1,000 KBs in size and also topologically associated domains, which um, essentially are like a loop, uh, except that we've just scrunched the, the looping DNA together. Okay, so um, this was a surprise. We thought, think of interface chromosomes as sort of being diffused and disorganized, but in fact, they were actually organized into loops of distinct positions that we could take, detect on our contact map. Second surprise came was that the formation of these loops depended upon our SMC complexes. Maybe not surprisingly, it depended on condensin-like complexes, uh, which we, I've already told you were thought to tether together loops in cis uh, for, to give you the kind of loops that you need to compact chromosomes for mitosis. But it turned out that cohesin also is, uh, is used in some cells to uh, generate these loops in cysts. So cohesin can not only tether together the two replicated DNA molecules in trans, but also a DNA sequences within a sister chromatid in cysts. Third surprise, and this is the biggest surprise, was for years we just thought that these SMC complexes were sort of like uh, a little napkin ring that's sort of held together two pieces of DNA uh, within or between two DNA uh, sequences. But what was discovered is that these SMC complexes are, are much more complex in their activity, that once bound to DNA, they can begin to extrude a loop of, of, of DNA. Uh, so they're 
active molecules, and this may explain their very complicated and long uh, structure, their long sort of long length and flexibility. Is that that's the kind of uh, features you might expect in, if you're going to generate a machine that can move something. Um, and this discovery was first uh, made in vitro uh, by the Herring and Decker labs. Um, and here we have a movie of that. And what you're going to see here is we have a piece of DNA that's been tethered to a piece of glass. And we've added, uh, in this case, a condenser molecule to that, uh, that solution. And, it, and you'll see that spot of bright spot is where the condensed is binding. And it starts to extrude a loop. And the loop is actually sort of collapsed on itself, so it'll appear as sort of as a line instead of an actual loop. Um, but you can see that the loop gets bigger and bigger uh, as the, the condenser moves down the DNA towards the two tethered ends. Um, and this was a remarkable in vitro activity, uh, really stunned the field. Um, and beautiful experiments done by David Rudner's laboratory showed that this in vitro activity was also happening inside the live cells, in this case, uh, using the kind of technology um, uh, uh, that um, you know, um, we describe for the chromatic capture um, to, in fact, visualize that these loops were happening in vivo uh, along uh, tens of kilobases of DNA. So why would you have these kinds of uh, looping activity? What would be the purpose of organizing the interface chromosomes in the loops? We understand why you would do it in mitosis. You want to compact them. Why would you do an interface where you don't really need to compact the DNA? And the answer came with the idea that maybe they control, uh, help control uh, proper gene expression. So you can imagine uh, along the length of a chromosome, you have an enhancer and a promoter that are important for the expression of a gene in the heart, and another enhancer and promoter that are important for the expression of a gene in the kidney, happen to be neighboring each other. Um, and uh, it's very important that the proper enhancer talk to the proper promoter. So if, for example, enhancer two here uh, inappropriately in talk to promoter one, you might get the expression of a, uh, a heart protein or a, a kidney protein in the heart. And that's something that could be very bad. Um, and so it was important to make these sort of uh, loops at positions where it's such that you would you could you know um, organize the chrome the gene expression units into the proper way. And in, in mammalian cells there was a factor that helped the cohesion spawn called CTCF, uh, which is a DNA binding protein which seems to help generate stops to position where the loops will occur. Okay, so we know these loops form, but what's the evidence they actually are important for gene expression? So it turns out that you can look in, 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 uh, 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 in cell types, and in particular, there was known to be a DNA inversion, which caused uh, polydactyly in mice, which is an extra uh, digit. Um, and when they looked at that uh, by this chromosome capture technology, it turns out that that inversion also changed uh, the TAD and loop associated with that uh, particular uh, gene that's needed for preventing polydactyly. So that sort of said that you need a proper loop to get the proper expression of the gene to control the number of digits, at least correlated with that observation. We also saw that if you remove the function of CTCF or cohesin, these loop determining factors, um, that you can lose the TADs and loops throughout the genome of a human cell line and that would change the expression of a thousand genes. So again, there was correlation between perturbing TAD and loop formation and gene expression. And finally, we could inactivate um, the dosage compensation complex, which was a condensed-like complex. Um, and um, that complex normally is important for specifically controlling gene expression of genes on the X chromosome. Uh, loss of the DCC caused a loss of TADs, and cause the loss, the proper loss of the dosage compensation. So again, there was a correlation between perturbing the gene products that cause loops and perturbing the uh, actual TADs or loops that are formed on chromosomes and the change in gene expression. Okay, further sort of an evolutionary argument which fit this whole concept was the yeast was thought to be a very poor model for mitotic and interface chromosome loops. And that's because here are the 16 mitotic chromosomes. But it is, they don't look very condensed. So it doesn't look like you know, yeast has, in some sense, a lot of looping activity. Um, and indeed, 
uh, you, from first principle, you would think, well, loops won't be needed in interface either because in budding yeast, the enhancer and the promoters are very close to each other. So you can control proper gene expression just by proximity of enhancers and promoters to each other. Furthermore, if you do the direct experiment, you can say, well, can we see loops in yeast by our chromosome capture, confirmation capture? And on the left, you see a mammalian cell. And on the right, you see um, a yeast cell. And you can see that while well, you can see the off-diagonal spots, diagnostic of loops in mammalian cells, you, can only, you can't see them very well at all along the length of a yeast cross. OK, so we've got a model. Everything seems to be fitting together. But you know, one of the very exciting things about active research is you get more, more information, and that makes you realize that things aren't quite what you thought. OK, and so let's go back through these observations. And you can see that um, the first was, well, yes, we had an inversion that causes the loss of TAD and, and polydactyly in mice. But more careful experiments showed that the inversion, the cause of polydactyly in this inversion was really because you were moving together two sequences that were only far apart, close together. And it, was, it did not correlate with, in fact, the subsequent loss of the TAD. Okay, so the TAD was just sort of an innocent bystander that got changed when the real effect was bringing together in close proximity an enhancer and a promoter that weren't necessarily normally next to each other. The second was that while sure it's in those human cell lines, we changed the expression of a thousand genes, but loops and TADs are present throughout the human genome. So there were 7,000 other genes whose loops and TADs were dramatically altered by the loss of CTCF and cohesin, and yet their gene expression didn't change. And finally, you know, while it was true that an activation of this condensing complex caused the loss of loops and TADs and, and also the loss of proper gene expression on the X chromosome in worms, when uh, did the experiment actually where you inactivated the, the or you, you altered the TADs and the loops by mutating the cis acting sequences? Um, now what happens um, is that the dosage compensation acts fine. So it implies that you need this condensing complex, but it doesn't have to act to generate specific loops in order to ch change or to properly control the gene expression of the X chromosome in worms. Contrary to the whole concept that this purpose of these complexes is to you know, uh, act at specific sites to control the, the inter interaction of particular enhancers with promoters. So I bring this all up just to show you that you know, when we get new observations, uh, we change our view of we have to change our models and have to rethink a little bit about what uh, uh, things might be happening. So with this in mind, uh, we decided to reinvestigate the formation of functional chromatin loops in yeast. And we, in this case, was uh, Lorenzo Costantina and Rebecca Lamothe, a talented postdoc and graduate student from my laboratory, um, who got together with Stanley Zai, who's a postdoc in Zabi Darzak's lab. And we recently published a paper in eLife, which describes this research. So um, what we did differently than I had done before was Stanley had invented a slightly altered version of this chromosome confirmation capture technology. So uh, we cross-linked the cells, but um, instead of digesting with the restriction enzymes, the chromatin digested with micrococcal nuclease, which generates um, much smaller pieces of DNA, gets much higher resolution, of the contacting nucleosomes. Um, and then uh, you, uh, after you ligate and purify the DNA, you do the paired and read just as we'd done before. So the outcome of that experiment is shown here. And what you can see are human yeast cells side by side. And uh, the uh, blue dots, or the purple uh, purple uh, circles, indicate uh, loops that are found close to, to the axis, which mean they're relatively small loops, that are found both in wild type uh, human and yeast cells. Um, and then what you can see is uh, we have a factor that we, in our, in fact, uh, Michael Peters' lab originally identified, uh, which is called WAPL, which has been shown to prevent expansion of loops of these position loops. And so um, when you get rid of WAPL, 
bigger loops can be formed and they can be seen as uh, spots that are further off the diagonal. And those are circled in black. And you can see that we, we see that in both yeast and human cells, when we remove WAPL, we see the expansion loops to new positions along the chromosome. So what I'd like to point out here is that if I took off the labels at the top of these columns and asked you which is a yeast and which is a human cell, you couldn't tell because the patterns are very identical. Loops, smaller loops along the length of the chromosome in humans and yeast, bigger loops uh, when you get rid of this uh, factor that uh, inhibits loop expansion. And so that uh, similarity now turns the table on what we think about yeast. So it now goes from being a poor model to understand chromosome loops to actually a very good model. And why is that? Well, we're just at the beginning understanding how the biochemical activity that people have identified in vitro translates into loop formation in vivo. And uh, turns out that yeast are really cheap to grow. Um, they have a small genome size, which makes the DNA sequencing cheap and the computational analysis really easy. Um, and finally, uh, if we want to dissect all the features that control loop formation, how active the, the complex, the SMC complex is, what makes it stop, um, um, why does it form, let's say, in particular points of the cell cycle and not other, all those kinds of things will require mutations that uh, specifically act, inactivate specific aspects of the SMC complex or the cell. And yeast is ideal for that. And we, in fact, already have lots of mutations that we can plug into to correlate what biochemical functions and how they translate into the in vivo uh, uh, production of loops on chromosomes. So we're very excited to use uh, yeast as a model system to study chromosome looping. Now, when you look at a contact map, uh, if I were to show you some of those, uh, they're usually pretty complex in which you can have uh, a single spot plus some smaller spots, um, all, and these diagonals and etc. or triangles that kind of off the of the length of the of the contact map, and um, these can be explained by suggesting, for example, in the cartoon on the left, that the sequence at position one interacts with a sequence at position two to generate a spot, position three, and position four. So how can you have a sequence interacting with three different sequences further downstream of the chromosome? Well, that could happen if uh, the chromosome actually falls into a, folds into a quaternary structure. And um, so when you throw in a cross-link area, it can cross-link one to two, one to three, or one to four. And this has been a common interpretation of what uh, these uh, complex chromatin uh, contact maps might indicate. But you know, one of the features of, again, the uh, the value of the yeast because of our uh, very high high resolution sequencing and um, quantitative measures we can get because of the, the abundance of the material um, is uh, some new new visions of how a complex contact map might be generated and this comes in this case from uh, information about knowing where uh, cohesin binds along the length of chromosomes using this te technique called chromatin precipitation, um, and where the size of the peak reflects how much how light, uh, the percentage of cells which have cohesin bound at that site. And this technology was used the many, many years ago now to define where cohesin bound on chromosomes. Uh, in fact, uh, Shikala Loria, a former postdoc of mine and a, and a faculty at India member, was one of the pioneers to first use this technology to map cohesins uh, binding to chromosomes. Um, in yeast and then subsequently by others was used in mammalian cells. So um, we show those peaks of crease and binding and what you can see is that um, a off diagonal spot arises from the uh, sort of the cohesin bound um, and for example the first one at position two uh, and bringing together a sequence associated with cohesin bound at position three. Now, one of the things we knew about the cohesin binding at these sites was that it was stably bound. Okay, so the cohesin bound is at the, the so-called cohesin associated regions or CARS is stable, but we also knew there's a second population of cohesin that was dynamic, that was binding coming on and off chromosomes, and we assumed that that was likely the looping cohesin that 
Um, and we now, third thing we knew in this study was that, or we revealed in our study in eLife, was that stably bound cohesin occurs, occurs prior to loop formation. So with these observations, we came up with a model, which is you first lay down the stably bound cohesin, which is probably doing the cohesion. And then this dynamic cohesin gets on and starts pumping out a loop. Oops. A loop. And um, it goes along until it runs into the stably bound cohesin and the act just stops. And that would explain how you could generate a specific loop at specific positions. Now, um, we have to incorporate that model with the fact that uh, the peaks of cohesin binding are not the same uh, along the length of a chromosome. And so we interpret that to mean that at some sites on the, in, the, on the, in a chromosome, cohesin is bound on that DNA in every cell in the population. While at other sites, uh, shown on the left here, the little red sort of uh, dumbbells, cohesin is bound at that particular site in only a subfraction of the total cells. And you can see if you sort of place those kinds of stops along the length of chromosomes in, in different cells with different patterns, you're going to get different looping patterns. So each individual cell, if we could do a contact map on an individual cell, would actually have a different contact map. And if you um, um, take all these contact maps of the individual cells and mix them together as a population, which is like the actual experiment we're doing here, you can generate a contact map which is identical to the, to the one that is previously or often interpreted as being uh, reflecting some specific tertiary folded structure. So this implies that uh, the folding of, is much more dynamic in individual cells and the pattern of, full of loops is, is, is different between cells. So now um, these observations uh, lead us to the idea that there must be some additional conserved biological function other than controlling gene expression. So first of all, as I said, we have these genome loops that exist genome-wide in an organism like yeast where there's no reason to evoke a function in gene expression because it's not really needed. The promoter enhancers are close together. Second, um, there's a heterogeneous uh, loop formation in individual cells in yeast when you want to try to accomplish homogeneous gene expression. So, you know, how are you going to get all cells to, if, they're, if, if all cells are expressing a particular gene, but only a subset of them have loops, doesn't make a lot of sense that that's what the loop is doing, is controlling, the, uh, ensuring the proper expression of that gene. And third, you know, in human cells, as I implied earlier, there are loops all throughout the genome, and yet only a subset of genes are causing changes in gene expression. So what are the other 7,000 loops that are existing that aren't causing gene expression, what are they doing? So we came up with this idea that maybe it's involved in DNA repair. So imagine that you have two paired cystic chromatids through cohesion, and you get a double strand break in one of those uh, chromatids in a repetitive sequence labeled uh, one and two here. If the break in one repairs off the sort of repeat out at the identical position on the other sister chromatid, you all will be good. You will just regenerate the two initial sister chromatids as expected. In contrast, if the break in one repairs off a, a repeat that is further down along the chromosome arm, that can generate, depending upon how the repair happens, a duplications and, uh, and, 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 and deletions. And that can be bad for lots of reasons. So thinking about that in our model, we can think about how looping activity might actually bring, by generating loops along the two sister chromatids, bring the broken piece of DNA in contact with the proper repeat as opposed to the improper repeat, and therefore uh, directing repair of the broken DNA off the repeat that's not going to change the DNA sequence and restore the proper chromosome structure. So. That's our model at the moment, may not be right, but I think the bigger question of what loops are doing in chromosomes remains mysterious. Um, and um, I wanna say that position loops uh, is a conserved feature of all eukaryotes. In fact, uh, there are position loops in prokaryotes as well. And the SMC complex complexes act to uh, actively form loops in all eukaryotes. So this concept of motors is like 
a, a real wow factor for us in the field. Um, that uh, the position of loops in a genome differ by the presence of stops. So you um, and, and for example, there is site difference. So in mammalian cells, we think the stops are mediated by this factor called CTCF. While in yeast, it may be the stably bound uh, cohesin. Although some recent experiments with mammalian cells that stably bound cohesin in mammalian cells may be a second way of uh, generating stops for, for loop formation. Um, and uh, the existence of position loops throughout the yeast genome, and in fact the human genome, um, indicates that they like to perform a universe function distinct from controlling gene expression. Um, so um, I hope you'll sort of appreciate this is a really active and interesting area of research and stay tuned uh, to understand when the mystery gets solved uh, in our little detective story some years down the line about what uh, chromosome loops are really doing and how they're forming. And so with that, uh, I want to thank again everyone in my lab who helps us allow this research to happen particularly uh, Rebecca and Lorenzo, and um, thank you for your attention.